In this episode of Beyond Markets, we're in Basel on the occasion of Art Basel and the Blockchain Meets Basel conference to talk to two esteemed guests about the influence of artificial intelligence in the art and banking worlds. Though strikingly different, these two fields often find their paths crossing, not least in the digital artwork Glacier Dreams by new media artist Rafik Anadol. I'm John Franklin, and I'm delighted to be joined by internationally renowned new media artist Rafik Anadol and Julius Baer's Head of Wealth Management Solutions and member of the executive board, Nikola Deskovronsky. Rafik, Nikola, hello, and welcome to the show. Rafik, if I could turn to you first, Glacier Dreams, I believe, was created with the assistance of artificial intelligence. But could you share a little about how and why you became involved in AI and how it's transformed your approach to digital art? Yes, first of all, so grateful to be here. And thanks, Julius Fair and everyone that, that trusting the journey of innovation, discoveries um, for digital art. So I started my practice 14 years ago, 2008, when I coined the term data painting. And it was a very long journey for an artist to claim that one day data can become a pigment and this pigment doesn't dry. And this idea of like using machine as a collaborator, algorithm as a sketching tool, or buildings as canvases, like these were like always the, the fundamental idea in my imagination. And inspired from science fiction, by the way, clearly. The, the near future of build environments, buildings, spaces, and most importantly, we as humans, how we interact with machines was always the, the, the fundamental question. The Glacier Dreams is using an advanced AI technologies, which recently we know of the generative AI, meaning we have a subset of like millions of information, an image, sound, text, climate, and scent data, literally the smell of this AI. We collect all this information to transform into a form of experience in life. Um, we are using cutting edge computation, like or sustainable cloud computation because it's a project about nature, so we are not here to damage nature. We are here to like be uh, careful and thoughtful, but also using extremely um, relevant tools that are very important for humanity right now. Uh, Glacier Dreams is using more than 100 million images of glaciers across Iceland, Antarctica, and Greenland. But one big difference, we are not using a ready tool. We are reconstructing AI models by training our own AI models from scratch. So that's the big difference. So it's not like a ready, easy world. It's a very uncomfortable zone for creators. And, and thanks to Julius Baer, we have this collaboration to push the boundaries of uh, generative AI art. Brilliant. Uh, Nicola, if I can come to you, art and banking aren't traditionally seen as disciplines that are too close together, but it seems they're finding common ground with AI. Now, before we look at its applications in finance, could you recount your own discovery of AI in banking? What shift did it instigate and how has it evolved your role? Yeah, thank you for that question. And so great to be here and to to have uh, to have this conversation with with Rafik. I would say, you know, on my end, it started with Isaac Asimov. And uh, really, as a child being born in the 70s, I was reading book, I was reading science fiction. And I just uh, remember that, you know, on one side, I got my first computer, uh, Commodore 64. At the same time, I was reading Isaac Asimov, and I also saw this world where, you know, human and robots would interact and would start to behave differently. And I, I was, you know, always kept this three law of the robotics in me and found that maybe one day it will, it will happen. And then I, I had the privilege to study physics. And after, you know, the winter in AI in the 90s, I uh, started to, you know, interact myself with some of the very early uh, neural networks. So at the time it was shoe data, it was just a couple of layers. But, you know, the fact that you could have something that was unsupervised, that the machine would learn itself, was fascinating, even if the outcome was a bit disappointing. And, you know, then, uh, you know, through my career, I was also lucky enough to start into banking. And then at the beginning, wanted to apply a lot of that. And I had to realize, no, I need to make a step back. Because at the beginning, 20 years ago, it was not so much about artificial intelligence, but a bit more about human intelligence, I would say. And, you know, just uh, realize on a step-by-step -step basis that you could collect data. And that through data, you could start, you know, to be clever and to apply, um, you know, new offering, new framework, new processes. So at the beginning, collecting data, making processes a bit, you know, smarter, but really entirely designed by human. 
And then now, step by step, we have the opportunity to use this data and to get something new, something which is a bit unpredictable and something which is smarter than us in some case. If we now think a little bit about the specifics of AI usage within both your disciplines, Refik, maybe you could give us a little bit of behind the scenes explanation of creating an AI assisted piece of art. I mean, it doesn't start with a canvas and a palette of paints. How does it work? Yes, so 2016 February, I was the first artist in residence at Google. It was a very interesting to know that seven years with AI feels like a seventh years, first of all. It's really every morning. Like imagine a classical artist, just beautifully getting a brush every morning, the same canvas, same pigment. For me, every morning I woke up, oh my God, the tool I use is not anymore up to date. Like that feeling of always be in, in, in fresh, always be in research. And I love this feeling. I think it's the future. It's the innovation, discoveries comes from that new feelings of like freshness every morning. But in our case, we use uh, different um, neural networks. As Nicola mentioned, like this very early days, there was not enough computation, not enough data uh, that make a complex algorithms. But right now, uh, current AI research allows us to like go really advanced. Seven years ago, I started working with um, specifically generative AI algorithms that allows uh, me and my team to train neural network with insane amount of data. For example, we download more than 4 billion images last seven years. Just to give you a scope, we may be the largest um, data collectors for art context, and not product service, just art context. Um, and then that let me and my team to learn a lot about what does it mean to have a big data and how we can narrate this data. When I say data, image, sound, and text. Uh, these three type of categories are very important for me when creating artwork. Uh, and then uh, the other part is, of course, people sometimes think, oh, it's AI, it's easy, now everyone is... Actually, it's very hard, <laughs> just to be very precise. Downloading data, cleaning and creating data, meaning like sometimes you download hundreds of millions of images, but maybe only one million of them is really what you are looking for. The rest is not about the, you know, the topic itself. And then after that, we have this AI training model process. So let's think about that very simply. AI's, AI algorithms are designed to predict and mimic reality. They are pretty much trying to create exactly the real things. In my practice, I'm trying to find the fantasy, the dreams, the hallucinations, which are not the fundamentals of AI research. To do that, we have to learn how AI works and then unlearn it and fine tune it. It's a really different thinking. So it takes months to fine tune AI models to be sure that it is exactly the artistic merit. Um, and then it is the, th the, the thing I'm saying takes a year, sometimes six months. So just to um, be clear. And then finally, there is the artistic computation. There's all data sets and AI learnings transforms into an aesthetic um, outputs, the texture, the form, the speed, the, the molecules or whatever the final output. So this whole process sometimes takes so much time, but AI is an incredible tool for creators, enhances the cognitive capacity of creator. AI, I mean, machines do not forget. <laughs> so there's so much pros we can we can go. And by the way, I can't draw properly, but I know how to draw in my mind and through mathematics and algorithms. So artists like me, digital artists, I think right now is enjoying this new field uh, because finally there's these tools that are allowing us to like go beyond our uh, limited, sometimes, cognitive capacities. I think that's fascinating. Well, if there's one industry, Nicola, that actually knows about taking time, it is finance. It's been around for a while. So how does AI, something brand new, currently function in banking? Um, could you give us a little outline and how might it come to be used in the future? Yeah, I think, you know, usage of data and, and applying data in a smart way has always been at the, at the root in, in banking. We are just, you know, being smarter and smarter uh, year after year. Um, you know, if you ask me a couple of examples that that come in mind, um, the first one, and you know, this is very concrete, is you might think for a private bank, one of the issues is how can you make sure that you always provide the best advice to your client at the right point in time and that you do something which is in their favor. And obviously, you can capitalize on relationship manager, on human, but in some cases, they need to be assisted and they need to be smarter. And now we have the benefit of AI. So... A uh, couple of concrete use cases that we have is on one side to make sure that we could have what we call a client fingerprint, where um, you know we know the characteristic, we know the trading behavior, the risk, the asset allocation, and everything that goes along. And on the other side, we can screen all of the opportunities that there is 
that we would like to advise on do a matching to make sure that relationship manager can get that at their figures tip. I mean, a second one, which we just started recently, which is to me fascinating, is to solve this problem of usually we know more than what we can tell. So the organization as a whole, we have an incredible amount of know-how, but if you might phone somebody, he might just not know that somebody else is knowing, you know, have this precise piece of information. So now we are working with internal chatbots to try to connect all of the know-how we have and make sure it can be at the fingertip of our relationship manager. Now, if you think about the future, now we have this breakthrough, we have generative AI, and you know, you no longer need to be literate, you can interact immediately with it. It's not as easy as it seems, I fully agree with, with Refik, but you know, the dream would be to start to use that, to yeah. co collect all of the content we have, to make sure that we can have different pieces of content that can be provided in different language, in different form, in different style, um, I'm sure you all tried, you know, on ChatGPT, the simple case to say, uh, you know, explain me, I don't know, uh, Einstein relativity theory for a child of 12 years old. And you get that, and that's really what we want to, to make, to use generative AI and produce content differently for our clients. Well, I agree. There's so much that we have to sift through, and it's to your point of finding the one million and billions of images, uh, Refik, that you need to find a way of pinpointing. Um, but maybe to take the sort of security integrity angle a little, uh, Refik, how do you ensure that AI complements your vision as an artist? You know, are you worried about it overpowering your vision or compromising it in any way? No, because again, uh, as an artist practicing by code in the fundamentals of AI, it really gives me the possibilities, not the fears, not the problems. I think when we understand the system, when we understand things, how they work, it gives us safe and secure space. So I think in my practice, in my humble view, because we are aware of what we are doing and why we are doing and how we are doing, I don't think it creates any problem. In fact, it creates more possibilities. Like it's, it's, it's this beautiful space. I'm not a visual thinker. I'm not a positive thinker. I'm just seeing the possibilities that brings that joy. And I think it's very similar for everyone working with advanced technologies. When we understand it, it has that all that power of potentials. Of course, that there, there, AI is very powerful. AI is very powerful. AI can alter our perception. AI can question privacy and free will. It is there. Like there, there is no way to say it's not there. But it's a mirror at the end of the day. A mirror that if you are aware who you are and why you are doing it, it's so clear. It's simple clear. So by the way, in our exhibitions everywhere in the world, we always have a process. Uh, exposed. We are very open, honest about AI because every AI artist, I think, are responsible to tell and share how it works. For example, we share where data comes from, which algorithms we use, how we fine-tune AI. They are all exposed, as open as possible. And that creates this beautiful, positive space that the audience can connect with the artwork and then they have an understanding of the world. I think it's a very powerful educational part of the work uh, beyond just advanced technology. So this balance creates this safe and secure space. Well, I think that that openness and explanation of technical processes uh, is something that also applies to finance and working with our clients, Nicola. But as the world increasingly automates and becomes more digital, how do we balance that with maintaining the all-important human touch that our clients need? Yeah, I think, you know, most probably reading the newspaper, there is not a single day where you don't have, you know, a new initiative sure. to speak about AI. Uh, we can see that around there is there is a lot of fears. And I think, you know, that's justified. Usually people don't really know what's coming. Uh, I think there is also a fear of competition because it's the first time in history that we have some uh, cognitive uh, capability that are here available at scale. So, you know, what will happen to to all of us? Um, now to your question, I think there is three elements that are that are really important. The first one is people tend to believe that you can take AI and do plug and play. That's not really the case. You have to apply some design thinking. And if you have whatever process, you mean to make sure that you can for sure benefit from AI, but have a process which which is still acceptable for human. You know, how do you interact? Where do you get AI from and what benefit do you have? It's not just plugging to a chat, but you need to integrate uh, this. 
The the second one, and I think uh, Rafik is most probably the the, the most advanced uh, on Earth for that, is AI as a human assistant. And obviously, us we still have the privilege to have. Uh, maybe not only cognitive capability, but human capability. So we can make a difference with emotional intelligence, you know, this good feeling, this empathy. Yeah. But we also need to understand how to interact with AI. And I'm sure you have all tried. If you ask a dumb question, you get a dumb reply. <laughs> um, you have all tried to create image as good as, as Rafik with Dali. But you know that if you don't have the right code at the beginning, you get something which is not... Not really smart. So we need we need to 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 get that. On the third point, you know, I, I come back to to my kids. Um, yesterday they were preparing egg dam and asked me, oh, dad, I don't need to do that because you know I can just ask Chat GPT for the reply. And I think it's very much about education. It's very much, and this will be important for us and and the society to understand where can we make a difference. What do we need to know because we don't want to delegate it entirely but we want to leverage and at the end to have this backpack uh, helping us to be a bit smarter and more efficient. Well, you mentioned society there, and it is obviously something that most of us, if not all of us, are probably considering at the moment. How does AI fit into the broader societal scope? Uh, and many debates are rightly being had. But Refik, if we particularly talk about your work and your industry, what ethical questions does AI raise in digital art? And how do you address them given the position of prominence that you have? I think it's just an incredible moment. First of all, again, I'm a digital artist coming from a very different practice. Like I'm an outlier if there's a data set because I don't have a gallery representation. I don't have a classical like artist, you know, education. I'm, I, I'm not coming from that kind of a world that we know very well for, for centuries, maybe decades. So from an outlier feels very fresh because then not only me, many people like me, like, okay, how can we, you know, discover this world through these new tools? So in my practice, the valuation is one part. For example, blockchain was very powerful before, you know, um, like how to create a value for my work was always a challenge because I I'm not in that network in the beginning, right? But the good news, blockchain, for example, as a studio, we were able to sell more than $30 million artworks. We raised five million dollars for Alzheimer Foundations, UNICEF, Sanjot Hospitals. So, if you think about the power of like practicing in digital world, you have a lot of like true power and, and transformations. So that's one big amazing part. Ethically saying, how can I be more profoundly impactful for humanity? How can I go beyond my egocentric context of life and apply tangible, or realistic improvements in life? So that's there. And the second part of, I think, the ethical context is what does it mean to be creative in the 21st century? Right now, these tools allow us to, to question the creativity, the chance, the control, because all these fundamentals for artists have been for decades now questioned again and freshly researched again. I love this questioning perspective of AI. Um, like now as an artist, I can program a computer and say, I want to take the chance and control, give it to the weather conditions. If it's a rainy day, it's a rainy artwork. It's a weather, if it's a windy day, it's a wind artwork. Or can AI dream a world that we've never been before? I mean, these all ethical contexts of what is creativity will be questioned through these dating tools. And lastly, machines do not forget. And I think it is an incredible cognitive capacity for humanity that will open up whole new worlds. Um, still, the big challenge for artists have to provide original data for these neural networks. This will not change. I don't think any ready tool will make anyone Van Gogh or Monet. For this, again, artists has to work hard to generate their own AI models. So, so we have to be sure that ethical context of artistic research will still rely on heavy work. So it's not going anywhere. Now, Nicola, ethics obviously are something that play heavily upon finance and banking. Uh, for you, are there main concerns about applying AI to how we work, um, particularly, for example, in terms of privacy or fairness in what we do? Yeah, I think this this apply in banking, but you know, it's it's much more of a of a general concern that we have. So uh, the first one is definitely about data privacy. I mean, we we know as of today that if you get a product for free, usually you are the product. But it's becoming even more relevant in the future, 
uh, because now your data can be used to create something uh, which has value. So this is a topic that will continue to be here. And I think we need to refine what do we mean by privacy? When are the data used by whom and for what, for what purpose? Um, and then I come back to what I said at the beginning, you know, the three law of the robotic, I think it's so, it's so much valid. Uh, there is a couple of elements. First, there is the element about uh, bias. Uh, we want to make sure that we have an AI which is, uh, you know, uh, fair in a say and ethical. Um, now it's pretty difficult because we human, we are not, and we are training AI based on that. So we really end up with a Democrat chat GPT and a Republican chat GPT. I don't know how the world will turn, but this is definitely not a very straightforward question to, to reply. Um, the second one, uh, which I think is important too, is about the explainability. People want to understand and, you know, as soon as AI will apply to us uh, in the real world, as soon as you could think we apply uh, AI, for example, in the, in the law system, and, and you have a judgment and suddenly you get an output, you will immediately ask, but why? I want to understand. And today we are not really, we, we are not really good at that. So um, that's another point. And then the last one, um, is responsibility and accountability. Uh, now we are all again playing with generative AI, but you could think about uh, Tesla, autonomous driving. What happens if there is an accident? Who is responsible? Who is accountable? And we have to make sure that we don't delegate that uh, simply to an AI and shy away, but that we keep mm -hmm. that uh, for all of us. Well, I think that the responsibility point definitely in whatever field you would apply AI is something that is going to rage for a long time. But much like the digitalization process, AI will continue to evolve, uh, who knows for how long. So, Refik, given this pace of development, what future trends are you predicting for using AI in digital art? So I think I completely agree with Nikolai because the, the, it all starts with data. It all starts with, in my humble opinion, collective memories. All our things we left behind, they are becoming these complex AI models. So understanding this really helps me so much, like what's going on also, like how these AI models are becoming intelligent beings of our collective intelligence. So it's a really inspiring point. Um, I think in my humble view, right now, we are entering into the co-creation phase of humanity, co-creating with machines. So in my view, we, we have to find human in non-human. This will help us so much to understand these systems from a perspective of a humanity. And the third thing I think I'm calling it artificial realities. Right now, the world is becoming this, the question is who will define what is real? Again, what is creativity? I mean, this will be a new trend, reality. I mean, <laughs> I mean, another trend, but the questioning reality is a trend. In my humble view also, we are going to this new era of research, which I'm calling it hypermodels. Right now, large language models, which are driving all these complex um, AI models, are something, but I do believe that we will be exploring not only text to image, text to sound, text to scent, who knows, text to life. I think me as creative mind is really questioning this, what are the next creative contexts of these extraordinary technologies? Um, we will see a lot about mix matching different mediums, video to sound, to sound to scent, and beyond. Um, so that's our next pretty sure challenge and the beauty of creativity for humanity. And Nicola, going back to something you, you mentioned earlier about knowing our clients and fitting them with the best relationship managers, are future developments going to mean we'll see a dating app for our clients and our relationship <laughs> managers to match them? I mean, what future developments do you foresee? I, I see for, for the beginning two, two trends. Um, the first one is the adoption of AI. And, you know, if you remember when we had the first iPhone, it took a couple of years that almost everybody would have one. Uh, I think now what we see is we have an adoption at scale because you don't need to be, uh, you know, specifically educated now to interact with AI and you don't need any hardware. You can just get that on your computer. So um, we will see some, some speed here. The second one is from a capability standpoint of AI. We had the first model. Uh, it was a bit of brute force training chat GPT, you know, using a massive amount of content on the very large, but we'll be smarter. So here also we could expect uh, to have an exponential adoption. 
Now, as usual in life, we tend to overstate what will happen on the short term and understate what will happen on the long term. So let's keep that in mind. Now, the holy grail for AI, from my point of view, will be to go from generative to have this general AI, you know, this dream that we would have an AI like in some of the movie that could reply to anything. Um, the second one, which uh, I believe is also important, is will it come to some AI which can be more efficient from, uh, from an electricity standpoint where you don't need such large amount of data to train the AI? Um, and then ultimately, everybody is dreaming about a super intelligence, you know, something that will be smarter than us. Will it happen? Yes or no? Uh, for sure, we will keep some privilege, uh, I think, with our human capability. But we have to know that cognitive capability are now available at scale. Well, I certainly hope we keep some of those privileges, but I think you're both right. The great unknown is still out there. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much to you both, Refik and Nicola, for your incredibly intelligent but not artificial insights. And thank you to you at home for listening. We'll be back soon with another episode of Judas Bears Beyond Markets. But until then, don't forget to subscribe to our series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. <laughs>